Hi, I'm Deepak Bhatt from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, reporting for ACC.org from the European Society of Cardiology and also the World Cardiology Congress 2019 here in Paris, France. And I'm fortunate to be joined by my good friend, Professor Gabriel Steg, who is a professor at the University of Paris and also chief of cardiology at Hôpital Bichat, where I had the good fortune of spending a summer doing some structural heart work. So it's great to be back here in Paris. Uh, I feel uh, sorry for those of you at home who couldn't join, but thank you for staying home and, and holding down the fort. There's a lot of good stuff here, but um, really we should probably just uh, first start off talking about the overall meeting. It's great being in Paris. There are people on scooters all over the place. I want to get on one and, and, and ride on one of those, and it's just a great meeting. What do you think so far? Yeah, I think this is going to be very special. Um, first of all, it's a brand new Congress Convention Center in the center of Paris in contrast to previous editions. So that's really good. It's in the city. It's brand new. It looks beautiful. We have a spectacular program, scientific program, that's been assembled by the Congress Program Committee. It keeps getting better every year. And this year we have to congratulate Professors Sylvia Priori and Marco Rofi for an incredible program. Plenty of good stuff, plenty of good trials. And finally, I think the attendance, possibly because it's Paris, because it's the joint World Congress of Cardiology and ESC, the attendance is expected to skyrocket. It might be the largest ESC Congress ever. Right, and ESC has become the largest cardiology meeting in the world already, so you know, hats off to them. They're doing a great job, and things started off with a bang last night with a reception at the Stug household. I'm sorry I missed that. I was uh, giving a talk at the top of the Eiffel Tower, so that unfortunately got in the way, but it was a nice place to give a talk. What a beautiful city. You, you really live in a lovely city. I, I, I've always had a great appreciation for Paris and, and the weather now, it's nice, it's just, it's just a great meeting. So for those of you at your home, thank you for, for doing what you're doing. So uh, good stuff presented today. Uh, maybe we can start off with some uh, GRACE risk score action. You know, it's an important yes. study that was presented by David Brieger. Yes, it's really interesting. As you know, the GRACE risk score has been established more than 15 years ago as one of the ways to risk stratify patients with ACS and therefore guide clinical decision-making and therapy, both for interventions, as, as assignation to intensive antithrombotic therapy, and so on and so forth, and to try to improve the implementation of guideline-recommended medical and invasive management in ACS patients. And what the Australian investigators led by David Brigger did, and David Brigger was one of the original authors right. of the GRACE risk score, he was a GRACE investigator, is to actually test whether a strategy in which they use the GRACE risk score in a cluster randomized trial improved outcomes as a function of adherence to guideline recommended therapy and outcomes. And the short answer is it didn't. But the good news is the reason it didn't is that I think the adherence overall was very good even right. in the control arm. And that is a testimony of how far we've come. 15 years ago, when we looked at the performance of most hospitals, uh, uh, in terms of um, managing ACS, there was a lot of room for improvement. And now it seems that clinicians have really um, uh, grasped what we need to do. The guidelines have simplified, and most of the uh, major decisions and guidelines are being implemented. And that's good news. Yeah, I agree with you. It's good news. And I've got to give a lot of credit to these investigators for randomizing and a cluster randomization whether there's a risk score used or not, instead of just assuming that it's got to be good. So it's the right way to implement things, right? You really should test them first in randomized trials. Another interesting study I thought was from Empereg Outcomes, which has been a phenomenal study in general. This was looking specifically at hypoglycemia and its occurrence, uh, finding first of all that hypoglycemia is associated with higher risk of hospitalization for heart failure and MI. Uh, that empagliflozin wasn't increasing that risk of any serious hypoglycemic events. And uh, furthermore, that even if patients were having hypoglycemic events, it wasn't attenuating the benefits seen in empagliflozin in the overall trial. So post hoc analysis, but I thought it was more good stuff in this intersection between diabetes, heart failure, and overall cardiovascular risk. It seems we, we don't stop ever getting good news from this <laughs> class of agents, right. particularly empagliflozin in the Amparag trial. Spectacular cardiovascular benefits, heart failure benefits, renal benefits, no major concerns with hypoglycemia. I mean, this is really, really encouraging. As you Good know, we're stuff. very frustrated because in my own country, we still do not have access <laughs> right. to any SGLT2 inhibitor. 
Yeah, no, we have them in the U.S. Uh, some issues with access in some places because of insurance companies and costs, but, but yeah, the data are really quite strong and growing. Uh, and, and the final study I think is worth uh, covering in some degree of detail, very practical one, a single center randomized study uh, of whether to, to zap people with the absolute highest current you can or to step it up gradually, finding that to zap them right off the start, that is highest energy serially versus starting low and, and, and ramping up with biphasic defibrillation for uh, cardioversion. So I, I thought it was practical, it was good, start high and stay high. Yeah, it was, you know, it's one of those simple, pragmatic, randomized trials that actually drives home something that changes practice. It's really impressive because the difference in sinusrhythm establishment uh, with these two shock strategies is almost 20% higher with the uh, uh, highest energy up front rather than escalating uh, shocks. And there was no safety issue, so that's good news. I think it's a practical tip to all of us to cardiovert atrial fibrillation, start high up front. So it was great stuff, and uh, there's more stuff. I'm getting a signal to wrap up, so we've, we've chatted too long, but there's some good stuff coming out of the group at Oxford from the Ascend trial, uh, looking at omega-3 fatty acids, other really great trial and registry work. And stay tuned, because the rest of this week, we're going to have great stuff for you. Thank you for joining.